So, talking a bit about co-occurring disorders and, and getting into a bit more depth on that topic from a, a couple of different perspectives. This is just kind of a very uh, quick and dirty look at for folks coming into treatment with a gambling disorder, the scope of co-occurring disorders that you're going to be dealing with. And when you look at it, folks coming into treatment, probably about 25% or so, maybe just pure gambling disorder clients without a whole lot of other co-occurring pathology. So the vast bulk have some other issues going on, either history of, a very common pattern is a history of substance use disorders with often quite significant time in recovery. You know, that five, ten years in, they show up with a gambling disorder. And a great deal of shame about that because they should have known better. But a lot of uh, mood disorders, depression, bipolar disorder, uh, anxiety disorders, and I used to think that, you know, if you had an anxiety disorder, how could you get yourself to gamble? Wouldn't that kind of be a protective factor? But I had this one guy with really severe panic attacks. And I said, well, well isn't the casino a little jangling? He goes, well, the first time I went, it was kind of a little hard just getting to my machine. But once I got to my machine, it all went away. Um, that all came roaring back once his money ran out. Uh, lots of trauma, issues, physical, sexual abuse, combat related trauma. And we have to remember the financial trauma of the gambling itself that doesn't often get talked about. Uh, high rates of attention deficit disorder, uh, personality disorders, and certainly substance use disorders. And I drew the graph specifically this way with an interactive arrow. There are some folks who draw the Venn diagram with overlapping circles, sometimes suggesting that it's really the co-occurring disorder that explains the gambling. And I've worked with providers in PTSD programs who said, well, we'll treat the PTSD and then the gambling will go away. No. <laughs> you start out with one problem, you get another, you end up with two problems, you have to treat them both. So we've learned that. So, Separate issues, they interact, make each other worse, exacerbate the symptoms, um, and, and all of them need attention. Only one study really addressed the issue which came first, the chicken or the egg. Now, in this very large national study, it seems that predominantly the other disorder came or was recognized or diagnosed first which may be how people get into the symptom and then nobody asks about the gambling. So about two-thirds of the time, the other disorder came first and the gambling disorder later on, which is why you can't just ask once when folks are in treatment. Some snippets from some current research on, on gambling and co-occurring disorders. In this study, they looked at problem gamblers with co-occurring lifetime alcohol dependence and showed that they demonstrated addictive behaviors across multiple domains. So we can't just look for one addictive behavior or there's no theft, there's fire. Look for other issues, spending, sexual addiction eating issues, and then I'll show kind of the way I graphed one client later on. And report a personality style characterized by hopelessness, 
impaired control and resistance <coughs> to externally motivated treatment of proceeds. Other studies have looked at folks with problem gambling and substance use disorders and found that they don't respond as well to cognitive behavioral therapy and respond better to motivational approaches. Um, so not a group that likes to be told what to do and, and how to do it. Um, looking at gambling disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, over 19% met criteria for a lifetime diagnosis of PTSD. Those presenting with the histories of PTSD more likely to be women, likely to have lifetime substance use, abuse and dependence, and lifetime major depressive disorder, current dysthymic disorder, so all the folks we love with multiple diagnoses and that clustering of impulsivity plus negative affect that complicates treatment. Problem gambling and trauma syndrome. Looking at gambling losses as traumatic events and seeing if people have re-experiencing replaying the losses. One of my clients who uh, actually, after he was in treatment once, just before he came the second time, was literally on a bridge going to jump off. Um, and part of the issue was he couldn't stop replaying the gambling episode. And he had refused antidepressants the first time he was in treatment got him on the right antidepressant, which really helped those thoughts um, go away. Increased arousal, I can't sleep, I'm agitated, I'm irritable, I can't concentrate, I'm restless. I, I've had folks who came in at the VA, we had a, an assessment unit because we were getting folks from all over the country. So they came into a closed ward where people were detoxing from substances and they had to stay there three to five days. And they were climbing the walls. And I would, and they would want to, in the old days, shoot them up with Thorazine because they were so agitated. So wait, wait, don't, don't do that. And I would just pace the halls with these clients to, you know, burn off that agitation. Numbing, absence of emotional responsiveness. Families think they don't care. But it's really this kind of numbing because it, one client recently told me, you know, I've lost like hundred and eighty thousand dollars in the last three months. Yeah, oh my god. That's traumatic. And this is somebody without that much money to lose. And he's gonna be broke within a day or two. And he's saying, It's surreal. I can't believe it. I literally cannot believe it that he's not processing that reality, it all seems unreal at the moment. And reality is going to come crashing down. So I'm talking to him about inpatient treatment. I'm really concerned. In a day, he's on autopilot. Another client says, it's like there's someone inside there who knows what's going on and is watching and can't do anything to stop it. I know this is stupid, but I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I can't get myself to that derealization, depersonalization, nothing is real, people aren't real, the money isn't real. And brownouts, it's not exactly a blackout, but people literally don't remember how many times they went to the ATM, don't remember that they drove back home to get their ATM um, on automatic pilot in a severe way. And gambling can be undoing. So if I have a trauma history, I'm going to gamble, I'm going to win, and that's just not going to take my pain away. It's going to make it so that the trauma never happens. And I won't be at all vulnerable ever again. It's a cure for the guilt and the shame I feel around the trauma radiation. In my mind, if I have enough money, that will equal being invulnerable from ever being hurt or a victim again. And at the same time, the losses reenact the trauma. 
gambling, especially on the machines, is very dissociative, so it reinforces those dissociative symptoms. I don't hear the intrusive thoughts. And if I'm a woman in particular, or anybody who had trauma, you know, I think of our veterans, nighttime is really bad. Where do I go to feel safe so that I don't have to walk the perimeter where, you know, I've been sexually abused and I don't even feel home, safe at home? Casinos are very safe places. They have great security usually. They're well lit and nobody bothers you. So if I'm awake in the middle of the night and I don't want to have nightmares and I'm feeling anxious even in my Casinos are a great solution for that. And the intensity, putting it all on the line, makes me feel alive. So it reinforces the numbness, but it also gets me out of the numbness with the intensity of the gambling situation. So it gives me the illusion of feeling and not being numb there. Gambling and mood disorders. Gamblers with co-occurring mood disorders more likely to be female, older, report higher lifetime and past year gambling severity, associated with higher personality scores for alienation, stress reactions, lower scores for well-being, social closeness control, higher impulsivity. And when we've compared men and women on impulsiveness who are gambling, they're equally as high with the women being even a little higher. And when we compare folks with gambling to folks with substance use disorders, gamblers had the highest rates of negative affect, highest rates of impulsiveness, and the lowest rates of, on this one scale, conscientiousness, which is kind of the ADHD scale of not being able to plan and organize and structure and all of that good kind of stuff. So um, there are... Uh, fun population to work with. So where to begin? Certainly, of course, the first goal is keep the client alive. You know, immediate, life-threatening, safety issues. In some communities, it can be real physical threats by lung shocks, you know, depending on the ethnic community, it's more or less dangerous to owe money to a loan shop. Um, stabilization, and you know, it's like the old asteroids game. Many gamblers, especially with co-occurring orders, come in with so many problems. I'm going to lose my home, I'm going to be evicted, I'm going to be arrested, I don't have money for food for the kids, the utilities are shut off, it's winter. Um, so just beginning to sort out those crises and at least put a plan in effect and know what the resources are to be of help. If it needs to be getting into a shelter, my husband's going to find out, my spouse is going to find out, and they have a history of being abusive. Where do I go someplace safe? Um, do we work on abstinence? the most significant relapse risk factors? Do we work on just limiting the harm of the gambling and then work towards action? What's most distressing to our clients? And often it's really surprising. Uh, it's okay if I get evicted, but I don't want my parents to know. So starting where your client wants to work and working towards all the other issues. And what are they most motivated to do? I don't want to stop gambling, but I don't want to lose my marriage. Okay, let's work on saving the marriage and see how the gambling fits into that. You know, I, I don't want to, one woman in the treatment center was there for marijuana use. She was living with her daughter and the grandchildren and the five-year-old grandson happened to mention to his teacher that Granny tokes up. <laughs> a teacher little thing. Uh, so the teacher reported it to Children's Protective Services. Now Granny's mandated for treatment. They did ask her about gambling. And she's blew like $6,000 in the last 
few months on Lake Bingo with great grandma. Did she think gambling was a problem? No. You know? It was just a way to get out of the house and not argue with her daughter about house cleaning and child rearing. Um, so she really wanted to be able to keep in touch with the grandkids. So that's what was motivating for her. So working on, well, you know, maybe if you had your own place, you could poke up in private without the little thing telling on you. You know, she didn't want to give up smoking or gambling. And maybe if you save some of that money you've been spending on bingo, you could afford your own place and you wouldn't, you know, so you work where they're at. And realizing that for all these multiple disorders, people are in different motivational stages. I'm ready to stop using methamphetamine. That's killing me. I don't want to be doing that. Yeah, maybe I've been a little depressed. Yeah, I'm willing to talk about that. I've wondered a little about that. Yeah, well, no, that's just what I do for fun. It keeps me from being depressed. I make a little extra money. So you have to juggle those multiple motivational cycles and keep connecting the dots to your clients. So, okay, you're ready to stop, so you want to go to some 12-step meetings and we can get you the treatment to help with your methamphetamine. You know, if you're willing to think about the depression, we can give you some information about that, how it's connected. You know, if you'd like to talk to somebody, we could do a consult with a psychiatrist. And I know you don't think the gambling's a problem, but would it be okay if we just monitor how that's going for you to give you a better picture of that, to begin thinking about it and make those connections? So designing the intervention to match where the person is motivation. Um, so, if they come in for a substance use disorder, you know, how, how you, have you thought about how gambling is going to fit into your recovery? How do you want to gamble in your recovery? Do you occasionally want to go to the casino? How does it feel when you go to the casino? Does it feel like the same high when you're using substances? Is that putting your substance use recovery because they serve free alcohol at the casino or it's readily available. Um, can gambling be a trigger for using substances? You know, if you win, you go to the corner store and you play the lottery and, and you win. And then you start thinking, well, gee, you know, I used to just go around the corner and score a little something now that I've got this money in my hand. So just looking at how it can be connected or it can become your next addictive behavior. And educating people on that. Just letting them know these possibilities to think about. And I, I gathered yesterday, I listened to a co-occurring presentation that self-medication, that term was somehow an issue. But gambling is a great antidepressant. It's a great anti-anxiety agent. It can, it, even folks with schizophrenia, they don't hear the voices while they're gambling. So it can be used, and even with physical pain, it, it can be better than opiates. Um, on the other side, people don't take their medication when they're gambling. I forget, I'm dissociated, time goes by, I haven't taken, you know my antipsychotic medication or my antidepressant medication or my diabetes medication or I don't want to have to leave the machine to go to the bathroom so I'm not going to take my Lasix. I had one woman who kept going to the emergency room, her sister called in and said we didn't realize why she was always going to the emergency room, she was going to the casino not drinking any fluids and was getting really dehydrated and ending up in the emergency room. So all sorts of connections. Not eating right. I'm at the machine or at the poker table for 24 hours straight. I'm not stopping to eat. I'm not stopping to influence. And I'm not getting sleep. My 
uncle, who, who's now passed away, loved playing poker, and the family would take him to Vegas. World War II veteran in his 90s, he would gamble 48 hours straight. A little worrisome. <laughs> not sleeping, not eating right at that age, even though he was pretty healthy. So one way to make the connections is to just do a timeline with folks. Okay, an attempted suicide. You know, let's see where this went. Well, I went to the casino. I gambled all night. I didn't take my medication. I didn't eat. I had five alcoholic drinks. I lost all my money. I felt depressed and guilty. I didn't keep my appointment with my counselor. I went and I pawned my son's Xbox. I went back to the casino. I was feeling more and more paranoid. I didn't take my medication, but I lost more money. I started hearing the voices again. So that the gambling can exacerbate those psychiatric symptoms. This was actually a guy, um, you know, I don't remember whether it was Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, but a rural area. And in the winter, the cafe that had a few machines was where he was to get out of the house. And he kept pawning all his son's Stuff. And they tried to talk to the guy at the pawn shop, don't accept his stuff. It's not his. And, you know, the gambler thought the guy at the pawn shop was his best friend, and the guy would not refuse to accept his stuff. And he would get more and more paranoid, and then get violent within the family uh, all around the gambler. So oftentimes also, once the gambling stops, then you really get a chance to see the comorbidity. So if you start, you know, pulling those bricks out of the barricade, you know, too soon, it comes rushing in. One client who had a horrendously abusive, neglectful childhood in foster care and orphanages and just all, all sorts of awful stuff. I said, you know, when I gamble and I've lost, I'll call you and say, oh, I'm so depressed, I can't get out of bed, I feel like just sticking a knife in my gut. You know how bad that sounds. Well, when I stop gambling, the depression that I feel then is so much worse. Because at least with the gambling, I know what that's about. I can control it. I know that I can just wait till I get more money and I'll start gambling again. But what, if I'm not going to gamble, then all that stuff from my childhood, I can't get rid of. It's overwhelming, and I don't know how to deal with that. So the depression that's underlying the gambling was so much worse than the depression because of the gambling. And he said, you know, it's like cutting. I understand why people cut, because that's easier to cope with that pain than the other pain, the emotional pain that you have. So all these things, the anger, the identity confusion, the trauma, can come rushing in. And there are significant relapse triggers. So as with substances, is how do we provide support and ways to cope with all of this other stuff when we take the gambling away. And do we have available structured settings and residential care alternatives for these clients who are dealing with these really severe multiple issues and need some time to get a grip on things so they don't just keep going back to the gambling to try to cope with that pain. So how can we help people befriend their demons um, without resorting back to gambling? And just multiple, multiple risky behaviors. And whether you're dealing with adolescents or adults, and there have been several studies uh, out of Connecticut based on a database they got on, on kids in the school system, and the fellow travelers, delinquency, gambling, substance use, poor grades, 
learning difficulties, attention deficit disorders, parental attitudes that are conducive to gambling. Um, they all go together. And you know what behavior starts first? At the end of stage, gambling. Starts before cigarettes, drinking, drugs, risky sex, all of that. And it starts, as we said earlier today, within the home. Because nobody sees it as problematic. Oh, I'm so glad the kids are playing poker in the basement and they're not out doing drugs. Yeah. yeah. Chuck E. Cheese? Yeah, I was at those kind of... There was one woman who was suing Chuck E. Cheese yeah. as being a precursor. And absolutely, yeah. it used to be, you know, the arcades, yeah. Chuck E. Cheese. Now it's all the games on there. You know, Game Boys, Xboxes, social media games where gambling is involved. There's just so many more opportunities for kids as well as adults. Pokemon. You know, and they know how to do that stuff better than we do. And they're betting on the number of points. And now, you know, in these games, you have skins. So you can, these social games are monetized. So you can use money to buy accessories, slicker outfits, snazzier guns, all that kind of stuff. And there are sites online where kids bet what are called these skins. They actually wager the skins on these sites online that they paid money to get. And there was one uh, grandmother who called us about her 11-year-old grandson who was stealing money on from family credit cards to buy these skins to wager them online. And I'm not sure how it works. It's kind of beyond my level of technical, but they have to be aware of how kids are doing these things. And these kids can end up in the juvenile correction system. Um, so all of these different issues. And here is one of my favorite clients. A woman who came to us at, at the VA had about 13 serious suicide attempts, lots of psychiatric admissions, uh, diagnosed with PTSD, had been sexually abused since the age of eight by an uncle, uh, severely gang raped in the military with severe head injuries and physical injuries, um, and came to us after lots of substance abuse treatment for alcohol and cocaine, then the gambling was recognized, came to us. After that, realized, oh, well, I'm not gambling, but I'm cutting. And she's been cutting, you know, um, off and on. And she was diabetic, so she was not eating and developing eating problems, so we had to track that. Uh, then she began acting out sexually, and so we had to track that and you know, engaging in risky sex. She started spending at... Um, yard sales and became addicted to that and kind of hoarding and so we were tracking the money so rather than spending she started shoplifting <laughs> and then in between she would go back to drugs and she got busted for drugs so she got into the local probation system for being caught with possession of some cocaine um, so she was being monitored for that and she would call up suicidal talking about, I've got a bowl full of pills and I'm looking at my knife. And I would kind of talk her through that, call the you know, 911, they take her to the psych ER. And then she became friends with the psych ER nurse, so she would just call the psych ER nurse. So little by little, we started getting a grip on these multiple behaviors, but it was like every session checking in on nine different behaviors and asking, what else should I be asking you about? And every once in a while I get a text and a call from her and she's doing really well. She's helping to train therapy dogs. Bright woman, put 
yourself through college after the severe injuries from the military. Um, very creative. Every once in a while she'll have a little bit of a relapse. Um, but by and large, living independently, doing some constructive work. Um, you know, so I, I think that this complexity and how you just hanging in there with somebody can make a whole bunch of difference. So all the coping skills people need, relapse prevention, DBT kinds of approaches, mindfulness strategies to deal with all the unpleasant, intolerable affect, cognitive behavioral strategies to structure, you know, experience. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What options do you have? We call it the impulse to action circle. It's like chunks of the pie people have to go through and the little diagram they can carry with them to take it through the circle to see which pieces of that pie you're missing uh, when you think about what you're going to do and whether that's going to get you where you want to be. So putting all of those pieces together to help these people with their complex issues. And you know, what are you eating? How are you sleeping? Are you practicing good sleep hygiene? Just the basics. Are you exercising? You know, have you had your yearly physical? Gamblers don't have physical, and they've shown that they have really unhealthy lifestyles. They watch more TV. They eat more junk food. They smoke more. Um, they don't get regular checkups. They don't spend money on preventive medicine and dentistry. You know? They don't take their medication either because they're gambling or because it's a waste of money. Are you getting sunlight? If I'm an online gambler, I'm not going out. Especially if I also have a social phobia or an anxiety disorder, I'm not getting sunlight. Um, I'm not connected to other people. The casinos, gambling, bingo gives the illusion of socializing. But I'm not really getting a social support system. I'm not having fun and I'm not playing. And spiritual practices have gone way out the window. So all these life-sustaining activities are really important in recovery. Folks with chronic mental illness are a unique group. And the issues are, are most often about the emotional impact rather than the financial per se. Money, they may already have a payee who may be pulling his or her hair out because of the gambling, so whatever little allowance they get, they're spending on the gambling. And then, if they're in a group home, they're hitting up everybody in the group home to borrow money and become a nuisance in the group home, and they want to kick them out of the group home because they're stealing or they're borrowing. Or if they're not in the group home, they're going outside the 7-Eleven. If they lose, they're panhandling outside the 7-Eleven and getting arrested for being a nuisance outside the 7-Eleven. Or if they win, they're really vulnerable and they're getting beat up right outside that 7-Eleven um, because they're an easy target. Or they're selling Lucy's or doing those kinds of activities that get them running a foul of the law. Um, so they may have a place, a roof over their heads and food, but they're getting in trouble in lots of other ways. Or they're homeless. Um, the dream of that big win needs to be talked about. What does that mean? What would, what's your fantasy of what would happen if you won? What would you do with that money? And the grief and loss and sadness of having to deal with a chronic mental illness. And how that dream of the big win is often about, like with trauma issues, if I win, it will take away my mental illness. 
I won't hear the voices. I won't be mentally ill. I won't be on. People won't look at me strange. I won't hear those voices. So a lot of that I'm doing again. It doesn't mean that money doesn't matter. I mean, money is an issue because I'm on this limited income. I don't have enough money to have things other people do. One of my clients' dream was, well, I'll win and then I'll walk across the street and sit down and have a steak dinner and be normal. I'll be able to have a home, a family, a car, all the things that I see everybody else having. And I won't need somebody to tell me what to do with my money. The family strain can be intense, you know, especially around these money issues because you add the agitation of the gambling up to that where somebody's already dealing with a mental disorder and the potential for violence in these situations can get pretty scary for folks. Um, so you really need to get the release assigned to work with the villain with the psychiatrist, with the payee, with the family, with the manager of the group home, maybe even with the you know, owner of the 7-Eleven. You know, don't call the police, call us. We'll come, you know, whatever you need to do to minimize the harm on this person. Often very, very difficult to convince the person not to gamble. The one client I was working with, his father, and the group home and the client and everything we could think of to try to help them not go to the 7-Eleven and then end up getting beat up or arrested. What we ended up doing, because we couldn't get them to stop gambling, is they moved them to a group home in a safer neighborhood, harm reduction. You know, still trying to reduce the harm of the gambling, but at least keeping them physically safe while we tried to help them reduce the gambling. Uh, you know, and the gambling, it's always this two-edged sword. If I gamble, I get this money, I'll feel really good about myself, people will treat me better, I'll be normal, but I lose and then I feel even worse about myself. So it erodes the self-esteem. And just working on helping the client accept their reality that you do have a mental illness. All the money in the world isn't going to make that go away. and working with the family on how they can help deal with this, set the limits, know when they can't deal with it and need to have somebody else involved. Um, so certainly having a payee or a fiduciary, we've done that and gone through that. I've not worked with anybody who's just gotten that involuntarily just because of the damage. People who've done it voluntarily just because of the gambling, but involuntarily it's always been because of the mental health. Um, and how to deal with social security checks, the VA benefit checks, all of those kinds of issues. And we work with families in general, not just with folks with chronic mental illness. And how can you work with somebody, a family member, a friend, somebody on developing a money protection plan, a plan so you can work collaboratively with somebody you trust on how to protect your money from the gambler. And very careful about how I say that. It's not protecting your money from you, but from the gambling. So you can join forces, not me against my family, but my family and I against the gambling. We're just trying to take all of your money. So I think it's really important how you frame that with folks so they feel part of that process, like it's not being done to them, and it's not everybody's against me and wants to control me. Um, we just want to fight against the gambling to protect what you've earned what's yours, so you can use it in a way that really will be helpful to you. 
and certainly knowing the legal resources that the family can work with and that the client can work with. Another way of looking at co-occurring is this pathways model. We used to talk about escape and action gamblers. This is kind of an elaboration that really is as a research and evidence foundation in how to subtype gamblers. Pathway one is, is kind of the straight gambler. Not much going on there. Gambling is linked to learning and environment. So somebody who doesn't have any history of co-occurring disorders goes in, gambles, they have that early big win, has a good experience, they like the excitement, it's interesting, it's new, it's novel, the dopamine starts going off, um, and there's that intermittent reinforcement schedule that's so powerful. These three <coughs> things combine to form a gambling habit. And they start doing it more and more, they may start having some irrational thoughts and cognitive distortions and keep the gambling going. And then the anxiety, depression, and substance use may be secondary to the gambling consequences. Pathway two, that there are individuals vulnerable to gambling due to psychological problems, uh, difficulty managing stress or dealing with crisis situations, underlying anxiety and depression. The key feature is pre-existing uh, psychological problems that create emotional vulnerability. Gambling is viewed as a way to escape or cope or a solution to those vulnerabilities and discomfort. Poor coping and problem solving due to inadequate role models, growing up, or past trauma. Gambling instills that sense of hope, increasing the desire to continue gambling. So these are the folks despite depressed, anxious, trauma issues. Pathway three, predisposing biology that contributes to problem gambling, likely history of a wide range of impulsive behaviors from an early age. May have difficulties concentrating, learning history of attention deficit disorder, overactive, that need for a lot of stimulation, do things on impulse without considering the consequences. So it's interesting when we looked at, you know, are gamblers sensation seekers and risk takers or not? And they may take risks, but it's not because they're adrenaline junkies. It's because they're doing things without thinking of the consequences. You know, it's like, oh, why'd you jump off the roof? I don't know. You know, <laughs> that kind of not realizing it would lead to a broken arm. And this is really that kind of biological-based impulsiveness that underlies a lot of addictive behaviors, um, maybe part of antisocial kinds of pathologies and personality stuff. So we have Lou here, who's a 56-year-old single white male, has a history of arrest for fraud, robbery, assault reports his father was involved in organized crime and was also physically abusive of him during his childhood. A long history of substance use disorders, cocaine, alcohol, prescription opiates, has been gambling most of his life, both running games and participating in a range of gambling activities. He currently owes bookies and loan sharks a considerable amount of money and has been unable to pay. He's on disability related to chronic back pain, states he's taking his prescription opiates as prescribed. He also states he has felt suicidal and arms and gun. So what, what subtype are we looking at here? One, two, or three. like that. Now, but that history 
know, there's that biological history of impulsiveness, you know, involvement in criminal activity. So a lot here to be dealt with. Clearly, you'd want him in some sort of residential or structured setting at this point. Whether or not what he's telling you is a manipulation, doesn't matter. Get him safe, then figure it out. He was a really interesting guy. Um, the opiates were a real problem, and he was going to docks to get more opiates. He really wasn't abusing them. He was selling them to get money for the gambling. Thank you for the gambling. So quite the Wheeler viewer. Tony is a 32-year-old African-American single male. He began shooting dice in junior high school with no time to do something. The only play for small change in this time, at that time, Dale had been contributing to any problems in his life. He had a great job with the transit authority driving trains and enjoyed meeting new people, and these people were often taking trips to Atlantic City and gambling. He made a few trips to Atlantic City with friends, enjoyed this as a fun time out, played blackjack, enjoyed the social aspect more than anything felt he was just learning how to play back blackjack and didn't really win much, but also didn't have any big losses. He felt good if he came home breaking even or losing just a little bit. He'd make these trips a couple times a month. In 2005, he began going a bit more often and at times by himself. This remained constant for a while, and then his gambling began to significantly escalate. He began gambling at higher stakes tables. He states he had met people who had won big, and he'd had some big wins too, once winning over 40,000 within a couple of days. How have he started them betting crazy and lost back all of this? He began gambling in the high roller rooms and playing high stakes black down, losing significantly, but had the belief that he was losing because he was playing with people who didn't understand the game, and they were making everybody else lose. To win, he felt he needed to play at the high stakes table because the people there knew what they were doing, and therefore he was more likely that everyone would win. He began playing high stakes slot machines at this point as well, and increasing his purchase of lottery tickets. He stated that while he began gambling as a form of entertainment, he began thinking that gambling would be a way to solve his financial problems, particularly his girlfriend's desire to buy a new house and also make up for a decrease in pay he got at work. As the gambling progressed, he began to use credit cards and cash advances. His gambling-related debt mounted, and he began to get behind on bills. He became tearful relating how he borrowed money from his mother to pay bills, and also emphasizing that he paid it back. While his mother was aware that he was doing some gambling, he said she had no idea of the extent. He reports one time as his desperation was growing, he went to a casino in North Carolina with a great deal of money, lost it all over the course of five days. The family was anxious, not knowing where he was. He was devastated and exhausted driving home. He thought of driving off the road and killing himself. And that's a real common fantasy, particularly on the way home from the casino. Um, after this, the reason I met him was to do an evaluation. The guys on the train started talking to him and he was saying his problems and his loss of money. They said, well, we know a drug dealer who keeps all this money lying around. He'd be really easy to rip off. So they went, made plans, they were going to rip him off. He gets there, they hand him a gun. They go in, rip him <coughs> off, and the police are waiting for him. He's a man, he got sentenced to 11 years. Um, yeah. So lots of ways people enter the system, and usually by the time, and what we recommend, you know, with the version courts, in, it, you know, getting in early on in that process, most often we get involved when it comes to sentencing. They've already been convicted or, or pled, and we just get called in for mitigating circumstances and sentencing. So are we out of time? Almost? Yes? No. No. Okay. This, uh, we thought Sue.
57-year-old single female gambled in casino slots for 10 years, had no other history of addiction or mental health issues. She was arrested for embezzlement from the nonprofit agency of which she was CEO. She'd always had difficulty expressing feelings and believed gambling served as an emotional pressure when we found. She was currently on probation, attending GA and treatment, currently works doing home repairs and landscaping, makes enough for living expenses, living with friends, uh, nearly a year of absence when she had a brief relapse, including two gambling episodes, during which time she took money from her friend's checking account. She feels frustrated with her, or feeling frustrated with her relationship was a key trigger. After one weekend episode, she tried to recoup losses. After the second episode, she called the counselor to report the relapse to confess to a friend and not getting into the past three months. One of the issues with the legal system is how do you deal with restitution in a therapeutic and realistic way. Now, to demand complete and full restitution is often unrealistic. Uh, we have uh, in Maryland a woman who, this was her second offense. First time was for about $35,000. They gave her, you know, kind of a slap on the wrist, some home monitoring did not mandate treatment. So she never got treatment. Back gambling. This time they say she took $750,000 from her employer. No way in her lifetime or her children's lifetime can she pay that back. Should she be allowed to make some restitution as part of the recovery? Yes. But to think of full restitution, I mean, that, that's just unreasonable. And making restitution can be a relapse trigger, so you want to make it realistic and reasonable part of the process. So how do they find that they start to open up books and she was on probation forever because you can't get off probation until... We have... Pay your restitution. I mean, and this is public knowledge. Surely, who was in the first video, who was the counselor, had been a lawyer, you know, this good day um, She is on probation for the longest I've ever seen anybody be on probation because of that unreasonable demand. But it might keep her Yeah, but being on probation for the rest of your life. Um, but deciding is that reasonable within the grand scheme of things is having an end in sight and working a recovery program sufficient, you know, uh, yeah, I think she should be off because it's not really doing anything therapeutic for her at this time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, probably not. Um, and can that be a relapse trigger as well, just as easily? Well, I'm never going to get out of this unless I get a whole bunch of money and pay this off. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but I think people should have reasonable and therapeutic consequences, um, but not ones that feel like a never-ending way. And, and that's the balance. Well, after spending, you know, multiple years in jail and incarcerated and at least five years on probation, and I often say, recommend very long periods of probation, like five years, yeah, but not so long. Yeah. 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 And, and, and like the woman said, the, the probation, they don't even check in with the family. Yeah. Uh, so those are questions for our system. What's therapeutic? What isn't? What's appropriate consequences? What isn't? And one of the differences with gambling 
when we talk to folks is, well, folks get into substance use for things like possession, you know, directly related to their addiction. Embezzlement is kind of one step removed. You know, so the pushback we often get is, well, we can't deal with it the same way because they may have a gambling disorder, but they didn't have to steal to support it. You know, so it's not just possession, it's not just for gambling there into the system, it's for something related and, and you get that kind of pushback. Right. everybody's on the same page and you know mostly you know, this was uh, a violation in another northeastern state and they never asked they never contacted me as a counselor you know they didn't care it was where are you you know have you had any interaction with the lawn and that's about it and you know, they had a monitor paying it back. And, and I think that's all important, but it wasn't done in a real therapeutic context. Um, the biology, when I started in the field, this was the state of the art of the biology. You know, wings on the feet for jumping ahead of predators, weak knee willpower, itchy fingers for dipping in the cash drawers. You know, butterflies in the stomach and ice cubes in the heart. Well, we've learned a lot since then, and that biology and genetics are a good chunk of the pictures, maybe 20 to some people say 50%. Uh, and we know that the same neurotransmitters and the same brain reward systems are involved in gambling as with substance use. Uh, dopamine, serotonin, uh, GABA, GABA, you know, butyric acid, all affect the reward pathways and the reasoning and the judgment center. Novelty, the reward, the intermittent reinforcement, the unpredictability are all factors that release dopamine related to gambling um, and make you want to keep doing this because it feels good. He gets sensitized, and that increases motivational drive and narrows the scope of motivational drive. So I just want to gamble. So why like people don't pay attention? Do I need to eat? Do I need to drink? Do I need to go to the bathroom while they're gambling? The behavior becomes increasingly stimulus controlled by the machine, and these machines are designed to be very addictive. Um, the multiple line machines, where you're always winning on some combination of things, but you're never winning as much as you put in. So the brain says, I'm winning. Near misses, the brain responds the same to a near miss as it does to a win. So the brain is going, yippee, and I'm losing my money. So the behavior becomes much more automatic pilot, and it's as if there's no choice left in my behavior. The brain responds to money. <coughs> if I'm engaged in activity where I'm likely to lose money, this is my brain here. Basically, the frontal cortex is shut down. I have to shut off my judgment centers to make a decision where I'm likely to lose money. If I'm likely to win money, I have this happy brain. It's all colorful and yellow and orange and some in the They did a gambling task 
for folks who had amygdala damage or frontal damage and hooked them up to all sorts of monitoring. If my amygdala was damaged, I did learn how to pick from the winning depths because I wasn't showing any arousal. I'd lose, I'd win. There was no difference in the physiological arousal. So I, weren't, I wasn't getting those internal signals about why do anything special. For the frontal cortex, I was getting the physiological arousal that was different from winning to losing, but it didn't inform my judgment sense. And that's really what we see with the gambling folks who have executive functioning deficits. They get the arousal, it's not pleasant, but it doesn't inform their choices around gambling. In the presence of trauma and stress, you get an overdeveloped amygdala, especially from chronic stress, micro traumas, um, that's going to override the judgment centers and make them more likely. Impulsivity in early years correlated with gambling behaviors in later childhood. Throw in ADHD, brain developed in like three years. Frontal cortex may not be fully developed five years, so we're talking now age 30. I think of some sports players. Anybody like basketball? Yeah, J.R. Smith, who is now playing for the Cleveland Cavaliers, if you know him, he was one of the worst knuckleheads in the league. Great player, great shooter, always do something dumb in the game and get himself kicked out. Now he hits age 25, 26, 27. He's playing well and he's not a knucklehead anymore. Either they got him on the right meds or his brain kicked in. But an incredible difference. Um, looking at persistent ADHD and gambling. So those whoops, with pers persistent ADHD, significantly higher rates of gambling. So if you have adults where the ADHD symptoms are persistent, much more likely. I use this task to torture folks with. You flip over a card and say, where do you think it goes? And I'll tell you if you're right or wrong. So where does this one go? folks, 
their strategies got more and more convoluted. So, and more and more irrational, which is just like the game. And it's just the way their brains work. An embedded figure test, where you find a simple figure in the complex design. In group, I use these optical illusions. Sorting out the relevant from the irrelevant. How many faces do you see? Three. The young woman here with her eye, her nose, and her chin. The old woman with her nose, and her mouth, and her chin, and her shawl, and then the guy with the mustache, the nose, and the mouth. And what do you see here? The profile or the face, frontal face? And then you can see the profile. What critter do you see? The rabbit. <laughs> the duck and the rabbit. How many faces do you see? <laughs> Lots. And about 13 faces hidden in there. When I do this in a group of folks with gambling disorder, one third get it right away, another third get it with some looking, and then about an hour and 15 minutes into the group, the other third get it. What do you see here? To some extent, yeah, luminosity and stuff like that. The brain is plastic, so you can start hooking in more parts of the brain and engaging in more parts of the brain. But you know, some people have limitations. Like with significant ADHD, I think there are some biological limitations of how much you can grow the brain, and you may need more external support. But when I give people feedback on this is the way your brain works, they're relieved. You mean it's not me just being an you know, idiot and purposefully doing this stuff? This is the way my brain works? Yeah. And we can help your brain work a little bit better, but we can help you build a structure so that you can support your brain in the work it needs to be doing, like building a budget. Somebody with these deficits is going to have an awful time constructing and sticking with the budget that involves structuring and planning and all that stuff. So give them a buddy. Help them with that structure of something that's really important to gambling recovery. Um, so, yeah, real important. So, who sees the dolphins here? Um, here's one. Here's <laughs> another one. Here's one little one. Here's another dolphin. Here's one. Oh, it's looking Yeah. Before puberty, kids see the dolphins. After puberty, there's no dolphins. <laughs> um, so, we need to make gambling and problem gambling a topic of conversation in at risk and vulnerable groups without increasing defensiveness and without judging the behavior. Understand the impact of gambling on development and for neurologically compromised groups, whether that's traumatic brain injury, learning disabilities, attention deficit disorder. Understand the impact of gambling for those in recovery And realize the biological piece and how that funnels people to gambling as a solution. Medications can be effective. No one medication that's going to work. Antidepressants have been tried. Usually those work for the co-occurring disorders that are triggers for the gambling. Maybe for withdrawal symptoms, for craving, for impulsivity and certainly provide medication for those disorders. Um, what may work for gambling is 
opiate antagonist naltrexone, but at pretty high doses. And it works best for those with really severe cravings, so it wouldn't be the front line thing to try. But if somebody continues relapsing and has cravings, you might want to try naltrexone. And uh, John Grant at the University of Chicago is working with N-acetylcysteine, which is a dietary supplement with no significant side effects other than it may help you, you know, with your immune system. Um, so that's an interesting approach. Uh, uh, things used for memory and, and Alzheimer's have been used um, and other drugs, but none, you know, have been authorized for the use of the immune. And, Parkinsonian medications, requip mirapex, mirapex may trigger gambling behaviors, and the bilify. So you have to watch out for those medications that are dopaminergic and may trigger gambling as part of the range of disinhibited behaviors. And it's almost impossible to address while they're on those medications. So excess that vulnerability, including comorbidities, Cognitive assessment, consider pharmacotherapeutic interventions, enhance acceptance of their whole range of vulnerabilities, and dealing with all the multiple motivational cycles, and things like active relaxation, Tai Chi, yoga, exercise, stress reduction skills, mindfulness approaches in small doses and build up. And references and resources. Again, the Montana Council on Problem Gambling and the council ne counselor network that they fund. So, whew, wow. everything you wanted to know about gambling and comorbidities. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. It's wonderful.